cameras to be on are oh and actually i never shared my screen so i don't know oh, yeah. if my Do you want to check screen. yours yours yeah. is okay yeah i'll okay. stop share mine yeah just to make there. sure uh yeah now i can see the share mode coming up um and i can i'll just Perfect. share my screen quickly so that's my slide so i will unstop my share i like your picture Perfect. uh it's one that comes out in emergencies yes <laughs> so it's like yeah so it's mm -hmm. good it's the student-centered presentation style by trevor boland okay very good uh, very good okay Perfect. Okay. Yeah. In the participants tab there, Katie, you mm. should be able to see attendees joining. I can. I can see everybody coming in now, which is great. Um, brilliant. So we'll just give it a minute for people to come join us. Um, met a couple of students here in DC today, so this is they're coming on board. Um, Fiona oh. said that students are coming here. Um, so Gertrude, are you in DC today? Yes, I am. So I'm in the office right beside Fiona, but not the old Fiona office, the one here. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Um, so yeah, if there's any tech issues, I'll be running over to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can help, but I'm here. Um, yeah, so we'll just give it another minute or two for, for everybody to come on. Um, but for those who have joined us, thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar for uh, students, keeping on top of your studies, getting an exam ready. Um, and today's webinar is with, as I am, um, I'm with the lovely Trevor and Gertrude from DCU as well. So they will do an introduction in a few minutes. But just thank you to those that have joined us so far. Um, so I know it's a busy time for students at the moment. Uh, Trevor, you were just saying exams start next week. So I'm just sure. next week. Yeah. So, but luckily we've got like exam boot camps even this week that students mm -hmm. can sign up to in DCU. So we're looking after them. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'm sure it is a busy time. Um, and just as it's getting ready for the exams, I noticed yet yeah, the weather was getting really nice yesterday. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, all the students have to study outside. Um, but yeah, so we might, we might, we're just giving another one more minute um, and see if we can start. We are recording today's session. So, you know, for any students that can't make it today, we will send out the recording to everybody. Um, and I know that it is lunchtime for everybody. So we will send out the recording. We'll just give it a minute. Yeah, so we might just get started then, if that's all right with everybody. So I said, so I'm Katie, I am the Autism Friendly uh, University Coordinator at As I Am. Um, I work with the lovely uh, Jennifer and Neve um, in As I Am, who are also today's uh, workshop, which is getting ready for exams, is with uh, Trevor um, in DCU um, and Gertrude as well, who's the mental health nurse in DCU. Um, so just to give you a quick little uh, up background um, about as I am. So you might probably know um, about us, but we are Ireland's National Autism Charity. We are autistic led. Um, and our work is really to empower autistic people to reach your full potential. Um, so while today's webinar is for students getting ready for exams, um, the tips and tools that you're gonna learn today are for neurodivergent students, but they are open to all students. It's gonna benefit everybody. So I'm sure you're all gonna take away lots of uh, tools and tips for today. Um, as I said, today's webinar is with DCU as well as as I am. Um, and just to point out, we have, if you want your closed um, transcription on, you just have to press it down at the bottom for live transcription. Um, and that we have it on so that participants are able to um, type in questions to the hosts um, and we will um, have a look at your questions and hopefully be able to get to them at the end. But if we don't, we can send you on the recording and we can get back to your questions that way. Um, and that, um, Jennifer, is there anything else I'm missing? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think you have I, everything covered there. Just, I suppose, if there's any technical issues that come up, just in case anyone you know anyone's presentation is broken and maybe we don't realize that you should be able to use the chat function to direct directly message the host and panelists and let us know if there's an issue but other than that you should be all good yeah, exactly yeah so we'll see your question if there's any tech issues and we don't see it from our side so um please do let us know i mean at the very end if anybody has so as i said we have the, a lovely name from as i am um trevor who's the assistant technology officer in dcu and gertrude who's the mental health nurse in dcu 
Um, so if anyone has any questions at the end, you can contact uh, me at katie.asiam.ie and I will forward on your, your questions then over to the relevant uh, staff members. And then as well, if anyone wants to contact the As I Am information line, I've put the details there. I'll send the slides on as well. And um, if you want to see about our fundraising work for As I Am, the link is there too. So I will hand you over now to our Neve um, Mellerick, who's our occupational therapist in As I Am. Um, and hopefully Thanks. we'll be able to, you can share your slide name, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Just give me a moment now and I'll get them up on screen. Can everybody see that? Might take a minute. Yeah. Thank you, Neve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I will just move our faces out of the way and just check I can go to the next, which I can. Wonderful. Okay. So oh, my name is Neve Mellerick, as Katie mentioned, and I am delighted to be speaking to you guys today. I am a senior occupational therapist and I also work as child and family support manager at As I Am. And I was asked to speak a little bit about planning and time management. And I suppose that the first thing I would say with any kind of presentation on planning or time management Planning and time management are actually very personal things. They don't sound personal, but they are because they relate really directly to how you organize your day and organize your time. And all of those things depend on uh, the relationships you have and um, how those relationships are going, how your job is going, how your family is. All those things will impact how we plan and organize our day. Um, and it can be really frustrating if it's an area you find struggling, uh, you find difficult. If the messaging is kind of just a bit like, just need to try harder to be a bit more organized, you know. Um, so I would never be of the view that everything I say here today will be useful to you. Um, that actually wouldn't be possible. So sometimes for some presentations I just do a bit of a buffet disclaimer which means I would really encourage you just to take what you want um, from this presentation even if it's one thing you know that that's fine with me and just ignore the rest you know if you hear something that you think yeah 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 I've heard that 20 million times or you know alternatively you hear something that you think definitely not for me you absolutely know better than me how you do with, you know, planning and organizing your day. So have a think about some of the suggestions and maybe think about how you might adapt them for you and your own life. So that is just my buffet disclaimer. And I haven't had my lunch yet. So that slide's actually making me quite hungry. But here we go. So I suppose as an occupational therapist, I have been talking about planning and organizing for years with um, parents, children, adults, teenagers, so on. And in recent years, maybe because I now have a lot of friends who are autistic adults or who are adults with ADHD and a family member who has ADHD. And I was get really struck by the, the terms that my friends and, and family who are neurodivergent use to describe themselves um, if they feel that they struggle with executive functioning or planning and organizing. And it's often language, you know, and this is from really intelligent men and women. Um, I'm a mess. I'm a hot mess. I'm a walking disaster. I'm useless. Um, and it always really strikes me because I think that language came from somewhere, you know, and I think sometimes when kids are growing up and are maybe not the most organized in the class or, or the most best with their time management, there's a lot of kind of jokey, oh, cripes, you're a disaster, you know, you'd leave your head behind if it wasn't connected to your body. But actually, I think that that language does settle in um, and it leads to a lot of self-recrimination and I think anyone who struggles with organizing or, or time management really can be incredibly harsh on themselves and like I said I see that with my uh, neurodivergent family members and friends but actually it's a bit of a catch-22 because often people who who do find the organizing and time management difficult talk about this kind of difficulty to get started with tasks you know, just that, that first step of getting started. But we also know that when you're self-recriminating and self-blaming, that really can lead to almost like a feeling of paralysis or just wanting the thing to go away or, or to post, um, procrastinate the thing. So it's really a vicious circle. 
but actually the more we know about neurodivergent brains, and I know there'll be people here who, who may have uh, more neurotypical brains as well, but the more we know about neurodivergent brains, we actually know it's not that um, a neurodivergent brain cannot plan or cannot organize. It's just that it's done in a very different way. Um, and they can actually see that when they look um, at, uh, at brain activity, when different people are doing a different task. So what I, I would say to you is you may have got to the point in college now where you have begun to ask for accommodation. So maybe it's assisted tech, maybe it's extra time, maybe it's a quiet room. And often people get really good at that in adulthood, that advocating for themselves, which is a fantastic skill that in my job, I try and instill in autistic children and teenagers so that they can grow up to do that. But you don't always self-accommodate. You can speak to other people and say, listen, that exam environment is going to be too challenging for me unless I'm in a quiet room because of X, Y, and Z. But actually, do you kind of look at yourself and think, this is really hard for me, but that doesn't mean that I am, you know, someone who hasn't tried at this. I have tried to be more organized. I have tried to manage my time better. And organization and time management are not connected to morality or being a, a better or a worse person but they're often captured like that in media you know that hustle you see the the newspaper columns you know I get up at 5 a.m and I go for a run and then I have overnight oats and so on so we're kind of caught in the cycle of that's the way to do it because that's what we see the most in mainstream media being celebrated but I suppose what I'm looking at for the next few minutes is much more around how you can self-accommodate for you rather than I'm, you know, yes, I'm asking other people for accommodations and they are reasonable and I need them. But actually, how can I self-accommodate and say to myself, this is hard, doing this a different way or, or using hacks is me being compassionate to myself rather than trying to do the task the way I was always, you know, um, brought up to do it. So in that thinking, I suppose, of, of uh, more neurodivergent brains, you know, again, going back to that language of, you know, oh, I get nothing done or, you know, I'm, 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 I'm never get things done at time. That's because we know from, from research on, on monotropism that a lot of autistic people and neurodivergent people have an incredible ability to zone in and focus in an attention tunnel on something that is important or of passion, or uh, um, if you're thinking of a more of an ADHD brain, gives them that dopamine hit. So actually, in one way, you are you are able to focus in a way that lots of other people can't. But the tricky bit is, is at the moment you're in college, where you have to hop from task to task all the time. You have to switch your attention from a lecture, then you have to switch your thinking to someone's chatting me in the corridor, then you have to switch your thinking to now I'm in a seminar and seminars are slightly different to lectures and how we socialize and how we plan. Now I'm in an essay and now I'm uh, now I'm doing an essay, not in, in an essay, and now I'm at a society. There is so much shifting in terms of that front part of your brain shifting from context to context that we actually I think is at its peak in, in in college you know I am in my office at the moment and I will probably be at my desk for the next Christ, six hours there won't be as much shifting for me in college there is shift after shift after shift and what we know about autistic and neurodivergent brains is the difficulty isn't from um, focusing on the thing. The difficulty is in unexpected shifts to that focus and having to switch from context to context. The difficulty was never that you were unable to focus. Um, and I'm sure if, if, if you are autistic here, you can think of any of your special interests and think, I can give hours, nights, days to that. So you absolutely have the ability to focus, just not always in a way that is celebrated by the mainstream. So let's see. So it's thinking about, you know, how do you focus best? And I, I spoke to one of my friends yesterday and, and, and in the office and he mentioned, you know, he thinks he works better in bursts, if that makes sense. 
So he might see other people who are kind of nine to five able to study um, kind of consistently, take a break at 11, all the things we're told, then go for lunch for an hour. But that doesn't work for him. And he has learned that. But what he has learned that he can work in intense bursts um, in, in a way that is, I suppose, more productive than maybe what someone else might do for eight hours of a day. You know, he may get the same amount done as me, but he would work at it in one intense burst rather than me kind of doing little bits over a day. If you were our manager and you looked at our output, as long as we both did the did the work, it really wouldn't matter how we chose to approach it. So I suppose I would probably fit into the more marathon uh, category, you know, slow, steady. I'm pretty boring when it comes to work, I would say. I'm, I'm uh, pretty just straight up and down. But I suppose what he was describing almost was instead of it being a little bit of a warm up, then a jog, then maybe a period of a longer run and then coming back to a jog. He's a sprinter. He will just go at it in one go and do the thing. But the thing gets done. And I suppose you might be thinking I fit into either of these categories or you might fit into a whole other category. And it's that part, that old cheesy phrase of play to your strengths. You are now in college. You have been in the academic system for many years now. You know what works for you and what doesn't. It's just you may have been fighting against what works for you. So I think when we think about um, solutions, I suppose, for, for, for uh, challenges or difficulties around planning and organising, Previously, as therapists, we, we were really bad at being like, do it the way I do it, with most therapists probably at that time not being neurodivergent. But actually, any of the suggestions I make here today have, have come directly from the neurodivergent community of what works well for them. And I think if you're on social media, be that TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, there is a whole community there now who are speaking about their experiences and their daily challenges with executive functioning. And I think in a much more practical way than has been done before. And I would encourage you, you know, to look to those voices to hear more and also to identify it is definitely it's, it's not a you problem, if that makes sense. So one thing that a lot of people would say to me is that it's the getting started, isn't it? The initiation, which is actually a role of the front of our brain. Um, and it's the OK, I need I need to whichever, uh, I need to write Jen an email, but the actual getting started of that. And perhaps if when you were a child, um, if you were identified as autistic or maybe dyspraxic or with ADHD, things like visual schedules might have been used with you. And you might have really bad memories if they were used in terms of kind of behavior management. But I suppose what's, what's worth saying is I know a lot of adults who use them now, but in an adult way. So it doesn't need a picture of a kid brushing their teeth, laminated and stuck on your mirror. But if you are someone who absolutely just finds it hard to get started, what's the harm in having what you need to do before you get out of the house for college written down in your iPhone notes? Your housemate won't see it. Your mum won't see it. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend won't see it. But if you're just can't get started with that first step can you have those steps written down for yourself in some way and I'm not suggesting you don't know the steps you absolutely know the steps to get out of the house but when you're someone who struggles with that moving from task to task having something visual that is adult that you can see can be really helpful but also steps for for getting home then so you might find you end up in the library till 11 p.m but you're not actually up to much but it can just be really hard to get up and go home. So I know of people who in their office, they have a little checklist for themselves that says, you know, last things I need to do are um, close emails, uh, lock door, get up, go. They know those things on a cognitive level. They know them. They don't have a, a memory issue, but they have an, an initiation, a getting started issue. So where can you implement little step routines for yourself in your day? also wanted to touch very quickly on planned interruptions. So I mentioned at the start, something that we, we, we do know about the neurodivergent brains is it's not the planning and organizing, it's the being interrupted. Uh, that is, 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 is quite difficult for you to shift. Um, but we also know, and this is because of something called an interception difference, which I don't have time to get into, but that feeling that when you're so focused, you might not notice you haven't eaten your dinner 
uh, you haven't gone to the bathroom. Uh, they're the main two, I would say. So um, I, I, I listened to uh, an autistic woman on a podcast who, who mentioned she just planned interruptions. So she might, if she is studying from 5 to 9 p.m., she would order food for 7 p.m. This isn't an ad for delivery, wherever you order your food, so that she knows the doorbell is going to ring at uh 5 p.m., 7 p.m., say, and that will kind of enforce a break for her. Likewise, if you live at home, asking someone to knock at 7 p.m. halfway through and say, your dinner's ready, if you're in a position where your, your dinner's been made for you. Um, and that's not being in, infantilized or anything like that. It is playing to your brain type and knowing that in order for me to take a break, and I suppose categorize my day, I need to plan the interruptions. So I'm still getting shifted out of tasks because we do need to move on from different things, but I know they're coming. I also know lots of people use um, phone alarms, but other people absolutely rubbish using phone alarms for time management. So I'll leave that one for you. Also thinking about- Sorry to interrupt there, Niamh. Yeah. Um, talking of interruptions. I'm so sorry, I don't, didn't want to cut you off. Um, no problem. Really fantastic slides and I'm sure everybody's taking away um so many tips yeah. there and um, we do have to move on now to Trevor but no problem we send everybody your slides from today as well so that they can Absolutely. go through with them. yeah I'd be I'd be delighted and I can put them into a pdf so they pdf Perfect. so they can be sent on thanks a million Perfect. thank you Niamh thank you so much no problem and I'm gonna hand over now to Trevor hello everyone um, so I'm just going to take a moment to share my slides. Um, so I think the slides have to be unshared. Oh, brilliant. That's okay. So I'll just share my screen. But if people haven't met me before, uh, which is perfectly fine, that my name is Trevor Boland. I've been an assistive technology officer actually for quite some time. And with and I have to say, I love that role because one, love working with students. They're always full of energy and ideas. So it's always good learning from them. And hopefully they learn from me as well. And it's also great working in universities because being able to help students, students in universities, I have to say, is amazing because we're surrounded by resources and facilities. So not only can we support students ourselves in our role, but direct them to, to other people who can support them as well. And within my role uh, in DCU as the Assistive Technology Officer, I've been able to advise students about using free and non-free technologies to support them in different ways. So if you've never heard of assistive technology before, I'll just tiny, tiny introduction about it. So one reason why I love assistive technology is because it's all about gadgets and technologies and having to use them to help us. And I think when people are in college or university or further education, wherever they're studying, that using these technologies, it's kind of hardwired into us because if we look at our history, adventure is in our DNA. So how we see travelers in the past, how they've navigated seas and lands, they have used technologies and implements to guide them through different lands and seas. And this is by creating maps, looking at telescopes, using different types of items to travel, to, to understand how to guide themselves from you know, position A to position B. And so within that, I think technology does the same. When it comes to students in a college, it helps. It's part of that navigation process that gets them to in, get into tasks and get them from A to B and complete those tasks. So sometimes people just have a tiny gap about assistive technology and there are different types. And one of the things that always amazes me about technology is that technology, assistive technology specifically, it has surrounded us our whole lives. It's been there with us our whole journey in life and we just haven't named it assistive technology. So we see low tech items like eyeglasses. So I'm wearing my assistive technology on my face because without my eyeglasses, literally the screen, screen would be a blur, my phone would be a blur. And unfortunately, and even at work, I forgot my eyeglasses on two occasions in semester one. So I had to borrow glasses and even use a magnification tool. So for me, I'm really dependent on my eyeglasses. And that's a technology or an implement that assists me in seeing things. So it's an assistive technology. And then we see, even through our childhood, we could have, we may have been using one of these pincer grips um, in the image you see on top. And in that, 
that pincer grip support, you know, helps us develop that pincer grip, which is so important because we use it for like holding our knives and forks and all these different things in day to day life. So as children, we would have used these type of assistive technologies to support that pincer grip. And my mother kind of is aging and she's really bad arthritis. So a walking stick is her type of assistive technology that she needs to get her like around the house. And then mid tech, we've all been using spelling and support grammars, whether it's Gmail or Word or Microsoft or any of these tools, they're there and they assist us just with better spelling and grammar. And they definitely support me when it comes to spelling and grammar. And then a mouse helps us use keyboards in different ways. A calculator helps us tot up numbers if we struggle with calculating numbers. And then of course, using our smartphones today is fantastic because our smartphones are just abundant with inbuilt technologies. So within your smartphone, whether it's a, a, an iPhone or an Android phone or whatever it is, that there is things to explore in the accessibility settings that will help you. And in particular, there is, there's even settings that will help you kind of read out websites and Word documents that you can find within the settings of your phones now. And they're almost, I would say, standardized throughout like the whole technology sector. And sometimes we just haven't explored those common devices that we use every day to see if there's technologies are built into these devices that can help us. And for me, I definitely use inbuilt features in my um, smartphone. So I have an Android phone and I use the read aloud tool. So it reads out websites to me. And then for me as well, I've got my phone connected to my Google home and I've got five of them around the house. So I can set reminders to myself. I can set alarms to remind me to get up or take breaks or give my dog a walk and such. So without those, I would probably struggle during my day to get things done if I didn't set reminders and alarms for myself. And then of course my phone is attached to my Nest. So that orange device that you see there and that Nest uh, basically that controls the temperature within my house as well. So whether I'm in my house or outside my house, I can adjust the temperature of my house. So for me, technology and assistive technology has really become a major part of my life in terms of how I work, how, how I do things at home, and just how we do things in my day-to-day -day life as well. So for you as well, it might be an opportunity to just think about all these technologies that you have around you and how these are assistive technologies and how they have a place in different parts of your life. Uh, and then, so I have this whole thing about traveling. So I'm just dying to go on a summer holiday somewhere. So for me, when it comes to young people, or even whatever, whatever age you are, and you're coming to college and you're in college, think about all these technologies that you need to pack in order to complete all these tasks you're going to do. So right now, you're thinking about your exams, you know, what tools or technologies you have around you that you can use to help with that exam preparation process. I'm going to show one or two of these things as well that I think uh, is kind of uh, useful. But even just for my students, like if you have a Google or a Gmail ecosystem within your college institution, um, that all these Google to implements, like in Google uh, Docs, for example, you've got a dictation tool called voice typing. And for some people, who are really good speakers, they find voice typing particularly good at jotting down information really effectively and quickly. And then there's even like spelling and grammar tools within that. And then some people have Microsoft as a, an ecosystem within their college or institution. And that means you've got access to things like immersive reader in Word and that can read out documents to you. So for some people, that gives us options about not only reading information, but reading and listening information are reading, listening, and then looking at the information as well uh, that's been read out. So it kind of helps us to learn better or more effectively, depending on our learning styles. So right now, in this short time we have to chat about assistive technologies, it'd be impossible to talk about all the types of assistive technologies people have around you. So that's why I just note this resource that I was really fortunate to make during my time in Ahead, and it's called the AT Hive. And within that, there is an abundance of technologies that you can learn about. So what I might do is I might just stop my presentation, and then what I'll do is I will show you uh, the AT Hive and just how to navigate it so you kind of understand the content of it. So here we can see so the ATI, it's an open website. You don't need to log in. You don't need to create an account. So we made it 
So you, people anywhere across the world can just click on the site and navigate the content. So the address here is head.ie85. And you know what? I might put it into the chat box as well, because you might be curious about navigating it. So if assistive technology is new to you, or for a lot of people, they've had a taste of AT, but they just want to know a few more things about it, then by all means, explore that link. And the first thing I might do is just show you the 12 categories of AT that uh, we basically assembled. So there's sections on note-taking, reading, writing, recording, organizing, using technologies in Gmail, uh, and sorry, Google tools and Microsoft tools, how to collaborate online effectively as well. Some people might be doing group work still as part of their studies. So there's lots of ways, especially online, using shared Google Docs and shared uh, Word documents to help with those written assignments, magnification tools, mindset tools, really important. And actually they get a really high click rate as well um, within the AT Hive. And then to communicate using so different tools to help with that. And then just in the main categories oh, uh, of those Google tools, we have a whole section about all the Google tools, a whole section about the Microsoft, and a whole section about Apple tools as well. So nowadays, it's pretty common to have multiple types of devices at your disposal. So some people might have an Apple phone, but they might have a Dell laptop. And then they might have access to like an iPad or an Android tablet as well. So that gives us more options about the technologies. But for some people, that almost gives too many options, which is why we created this AT Hive. So people can explore at their own pace all these different tools that they have available to them. So um, I'll just click on the mindset one because actually it's a really common one. So we see some links to different apps and actually there was a there's a fantastic um, AT officer in UCD actually, uh, who actually created some of these websites about this. So what in particular stands out in some cases when it comes to students is that idea of procrastination that was that Neve kind of touched on before. And in this, we have this tool. It, it's been around for a long time. It's called Written Kitten. And as we see, each tool that's mentioned in the AT Hive has a whole web page dedicated to it. And Written Kitten, I think, is a really good tool to get you started. So if you note know that procrastination is something that you're kind of having, maybe with a particular assignment, the Written Kitten, here's one I opened earlier, actually, and I'll share the link with you as well. And I'll share these links as well with uh, Kate afterwards, so she can pass them on to anyone who's watching or anyone who couldn't attend. So Written Kitten, open website again. And what I love about it is that you set a word goal for yourself. Because sometimes I notice that if a task seems really huge, and I definitely notice with me that I, the first thing I need to do about it is to just chunk it down, to make it really manageable so I can do it. So today I've had to do that with a task I've had to do for work. So I've had to chunk it down to make it manageable so I can you know, basically complete it for the sake of my manager. So here I can chunk information down into 100 words, 200 words, 500 or 1,000. And then within that, because I'm a visual person and I love rewards, I can reward myself when I complete my task of 100 words. So written kitten, I'm not a big cat lover, I have to admit, but I'm definitely a dog lover. So I can reward myself with an image of a puppy once I accomplish my word goal of 100 words. So I can just start writing. This is me typing. And when I accomplish that, I get my reward of a picture of a puppy. And then after that, I can take a break for a few minutes, or I can just set a new word goal and give myself another word target. So I might be feeling braver, more confident, and give myself a word goal of two or 500 words then to just further help me push along with that. So I notice for me, rewards are a really good incentive uh, for me to get uh, a task done as well. So I make sure, and it was a really lovely person I know called Geraldine who advised me about this a couple of years ago. And I've tried to really make it part of the way that I work and I study, and it's really, really helped me. So AT Hive has loads more tools um, that can help, but here I'm just gonna show one or two of my favorites. So here we have this tool by Blackboard Ally, and Blackboard, where they were really generous during the pandemic, they made this tool that's normally paid for, they made it for free for basically the public, especially students. 
And what a Blackboard Ally does in particular, especially this website, is that you can upload a Word document and that Word document can be converted into a couple of different things. So here I'll just click browse and I'll just click on this Word document and we see, and I'll just say DCU, I'm not a robot, thank you very much. And then it'll just take a moment and I have the option then of converting this into an MP3. So if you're with a college or institution that's not part of Blackboard Ally, you can use this website, again, totally free to use. So wherever you are, you're not at any disadvantage. And then you can download the MP3 of that Word file. And then you can put that MP3 on your phone device uh, or whatever, and then go for a walk and listen back to that information. So you get fresh air, you get to move your body in it and try out in a new context. And then the other thing is, then you get to listen to the information. And I find the great thing about listening or using these MP3 tools is that uh, I can then listen to the, the information in a new way especially when it comes to proofreading, because I'm not so good at the proofreading. It's not a, a task I really look forward to. So anything that can help me listen to assignments as a way of listening to see, here, are they accurate? As well as that, listening to assignments or listening to information helps me to memorize it a lot better than reading it. So that's something I've noticed in myself as well. And then there's this tool as well um, that I have to say I'm a big fan of. So the Pomodoro technique is something that I've noticed sometimes when students have heard about this and tried it, they are really, really into it. So this is a site. So there's loads of these Pomodoro websites. So I'm just going to share this one because I just think it's really nice to use, really easy to use. And then you can add tasks. So you can see I've written just one task for myself to read my study notes and I can click start on this. So once I click start for 25 minutes, I'm going to work or this is going to help me encourage me even to study in an effective way for 25 minutes. And then afterwards, I can choose a short break or a long break of five or 10 minutes and then resume as well back on that because I used to have this really bad habit of trying to study for hours and hours and then with no breaks. And that for me was counterproductive as then I would forget or I'd just burn out. So for me, things like the Pomodoro technique is a really, really good tool to help me, you know, and others to break up that time to, you know, refresh our mind, refresh our brain, and then to, you know, get that kind of rest and study period. That's a really important balance as well during that. And then finally, I'm just going to show this tool. So generally people have access to Word. Uh, they would have access to Microsoft tools as well. And then if that's the case, that's fantastic. So within Word, and I'm a big fan of using my Word Online account as well. So if you have a Microsoft account, you more than likely have a Word Online account. And then within this Word account where I've got information written here, I can click on the View tab. I can click on Immersive Reader. And those kind of study notes that I would have written up um, to help me revise information. Again, reading it, I've noticed for me, has somewhat potential um, to help me study, but I can definitely study and retain information more by um, reading and listening. So if I press play, which I'm going to do now, this will read out and it will also allow me to read along with it as well. Digital accessibility for educators. So that voice is a bit slow. So I can click on the settings here. I can speed it up. I can also choose a different type of voice. Educators. Section one, introduction. As a teacher or lecturer, the new legislation can seem daunting. Perfect. So for me, and even like there's one lecturer I know in TCD, she uses this to um, have her assignments that, written, that are written by students and have them read back so she can grade them. So Immersive Reader is this fantastic inbuilt tool that you can use anywhere and explore it and see if it works and if it connects with you. And then I can exit Immersive Reader like this. So that's just a really snappy, short view of you know, these kind of tools that you can find um, in, in some of your ecosystems that are free on some websites that you can avail of, but definitely take the time to explore the tools you have available now to see 
in the short, immediate way, is there just a quick win with a technology that's going to help you get ready for those exams that are coming? And some of those quick wins could be immersive reader, could be that Blackboard Ally tool to convert a Word document into an MP3, or using written kitten. If you're procrastinating about something right now, that's a written assignment and just to get you over that hump and to get that brain just trying to, um, you know, explore that topic that you're trying to avoid. And then even the Pomodoro technique, which is a great way of just being able to divide your time between rest and work and give you that opportunity to basically be at the most productive type of person you can be right now at this uh, important stage. So thanks very much for listening. Um, if you have Thank any you. questions, I'm happy to answer them uh, and pass them on uh, to, to, to whoever in As I Am will be answering those. And I'm happy to work with those people on this. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. That was brilliant. Um, I'm definitely going to start using all of those apps today for my work. Um, so <laughs> really good. Um, so thank you so much. I am now going to pass over to Gertrude um, and you can show your slides, Gertrude. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Gertrude. One second. I'm just going to share my slides. Ooh, just a second. Great. So welcome, everybody. So I'm Gertrude Fry. I'm a mental health nurse here in DCU. So I'm going to talk about, again, your mental health, how to look after yourself and get prepared for this study season. So um, I'm going to do that using the decider skills. And um, we'll just talk about that in just a minute. So what are the decider skills? So they're a set of skills from um, using the cognitive behavior therapy to teach children, young people and adults skills to recognize their own thoughts, feelings and behaviors, allowing them to monitor and manage their own emotions and mental health. And um, it uses the skills are designed to enable participants to make effective changes to help manage the stress, regulate their emotions, increase mindfulness and promote effective communication and to help them live a more successful, less impulsive life. So basically, we kind of look at your emotions and see, okay, well, how are you managing them? How, what's helpful and what's not helpful? So we're going to talk through those a little bit. So the point of the skills, this is like a, a pictorial representation of a life jacket. So the point of it is to kind of bridge the gap between your old self and your new self. So the old self looks at the, kind of the ways that you would have been dealing with the stress or just when things went wrong or when you found things just a little bit difficult, how you would have dealt with it before. Maybe you would have gotten very upset, very angry, very sad, isolate yourself or whatever it may be, maybe you might have procrastinated. So these skills is try to fill you up with some tools that you can use to help you feel like you have some resources to kind of manage and help you kind of live more effectively. So it kind of comes from this thing of the fizz. The reason why we kind of talk about this is because, again, as exam times, things are so difficult at the moment. You have, again, trying to organize your exams, organize your study and organize, eat, sleep, have water, look after yourself during all of this. And sometimes this can get quite overwhelming. So again, the bottle kind of represents, again, filling up your cup and when it gets a bit too full. You can see there at the end, there's like a little sad face. That's kind of what happens maybe on the day-to-day -day how you're kind of managing your emotions. Whereas on the other side, you'll see it says as a decider, which will use skills to kind of help you feel a little bit better about yourself, a bit better about the situation. So there's usually a set of 20 skills, but we're only gonna go through a few today, maybe about four or five. So the first one is the stress tolerance. So the stress tolerance, um, what is it? It's skills that help tolerate the current situation and accept that the emotional pain we're feeling will pass. There's the survival, survival strategies for emotional emergencies. They help us get through the stress in times without acting on our impulses and making things worse. So the first skill we're going to talk about is the stop skill. So again, very self-explanatory. It's basically like kind of just trying to stop it right there. More about paying attention to it. So the S starts stands for stop. So it's kind of like saying just do not react, stay in control. Again, that's not always possible, but it's more about just bringing to your awareness what's going on. T is to take a deep breath. So just breathe. One, two, three, four, five. Inhale, exhale. Just take a moment for yourself, just to be. O is to observe. What am I reacting to? Where is my focus? Try not to act impulsively. So try to just pay attention to what's really going on for you in that moment. P is to pull back, maybe put in some perspective. What's another way of looking at this? What would somebody else say? What would you say to yourself if somebody else was going through this? 
And then piece of practice. What worked for you when you had that experience? Did this skill work? Does it need a bit more practice? Um, and what do you think will help the most? So the next skill then is it will pass. So this is a great one because it kind of like represents that tunnel vision. So oftentimes, sorry, I'm just going to move this. Okay, um, this skill helps us to accept that sometimes we cannot change a situation and all we can do is keep going. So the emotion will pass. When we're feeling trapped, it could be helpful to imagine that we're passing through this long tunnel. And so the end is near. Sometimes it seems far, but they're like the light at the end of the tunnel. While we're in tow, we may be trying to escape, but when we are there, you see there is no option but to just keep going. Each step will take a little bit nearer to the end of the tunnel. So you will feel physical sensations of maybe the anxiety or the experience or whatever is distressing you in that experience. But it's important to remember that you are not in a physical threat, but it is normal as your body cannot tell the difference, but your mind can. So it's important in those times to learn to notice those sensations. Notice the impulse urges that you have to react, maybe to just lash out, to get angry, to cry, but sometimes a good cry is needed. Or maybe it's just to drop everything and just avoid and leave. Rather than reacting in the old way, we can acknowledge the fact that you know this is normal and choose not to react, but simply let it be. Again, it does take time. These skills aren't 100% uh, are gonna work all the time. You have to find the skills within this that help you and make the situation a little bit easier for you. So here we have another skill, which is grounding techniques. So there's two skills I have here. One of them is the five for two, two, one, which is right now, and the other one is breathe. They're kind of interlinked because again, it's about giving yourself that moment to just be in that moment, process that moment, and just be within yourself. So the grounding technique, um, five, four, three, two, one, kind of starts with maybe thinking of five things that you can see right now, or maybe you can imagine. Four things you can hear, or you can imagine hearing. Three things you can touch, or you can imagine touch it. Or two things you can smell, and or like the smell of. And then one deep, slow breath, in through your nose and out through your mouth. Then simply focus on breathing in this moment. So what this does is just rounds you. Sometimes again, when you if you imagine that fizzy bottle that we just looked at, everything is up in arms. You're feeling so anxious. Every your physical sensations are tingling. You're feeling sweaty palms. All the symptoms of anxiety are coming up for you. This is kind of just set your body back to its normal rhythm of saying, okay. Things are going up in arms, but we're not up in arms. It's like telling your mind, okay, things have to, are just difficult now, but we need to just kind of regulate a little bit and see what we can do. So again, it's not always that easy. So you have to find what works for you, but hopefully this could be a skill that you can put in your toolbox to kind of help you manage those situations. Other grounding techniques you may have heard of is like those little fidget toys. And what I find is a lot of people like like ice packs, maybe put on the forehead or the back of their neck, just to give that like physical benefits. And then later on that will also add to mental benefits. So some things that you could do to kind of help um, to ground you or soothe you in those moments when you're feeling distressed is maybe doing something with your five senses. So maybe the first one here is vision. Again, some people might need to go to a museum or an art gallery just to escape. When things are getting so difficult, I'm not saying drop everything and go, but maybe you can schedule it in a little bit just so you can have a different perspective and that like you can focus on something else and then come back to the study later. Again, not spending a whole day or anything, but again, maybe just looking at a painting somewhere for a few minutes just to get into a different mindset. Maybe you can watch a um, film or a documentary in the evening just to unwind after a hard day of study. Again, the importance of taking breaks is so, is so needed. Maybe walk in the park or walk around the campus, whichever is easier for you. Um, visualize a beautiful place or pay attention to the details of that place, noticing colors, shapes, and movements. So again, you can use like, um, like a meditation just to think of a place that you really enjoy and just meditate on that for a few minutes. Um, another student technique could be something that you can hear. So put in some relax relaxation music, inspiring music, sounds of nature, paying attention to the sounds around you, wherever you are. Now, I know for somebody struggling with autism, there could be a lot of sounds. So maybe you need to get into somewhere where it's a little less sound so you can just focus on just one sound rather than the overstimulation of many. And um, taste. 
eat a little of your favorite foods, savor each moment, and um, eat slowly and mindfully, maybe even cook your favorite meal or drink a soothing drink, a soothing drink such as hot chocolate or herbal tea. And um, maybe you can find something that you can smell. So think about your favorite smells. Again, you don't want something too overpowering or too overwhelming because if you don't like it, that's going to add to your distress. We you want to find maybe some like essential oils or candles or something that you actually do enjoy, even if it's just a natural smell like coffee, freshly baked bread, flowers, or grass mowing. Um, and then touch. You can massage your hands, maybe stroke a pet or some, give someone a cuddle, prepare a bubble bath, swim at the local pool. And also to pay attention to how good these things feel on your skin. And that's the most important thing. So I'm always talking about self-care because I think when things get really busy like this, we kind of just neglect ourselves. And that kind of adds to the stress because we feel like, oh, we must go and study, like Trevor said, for like five, six, seven hours at a time with no breaks. And that just adds to the stress. So if you don't get it all done in that time, you're like, why did I not do this? So we need to schedule in some self-care time. But with that, we need to have a toolbox for when things are going wrong. So some like actual tools could be maybe, again, having like little prompts to write or prompt in your little box to say, okay, go for nature, eat something nice, and um, talk to somebody, play some music, move your body. These little prompts can be put in like a little box. Just remind yourself that, okay, when things are going wrong, let me pull out this box and see, okay, what can I do that can make me feel good? Again, it doesn't have to be exactly these, but it could be something like, I don't know, playing video games or getting a burger it could be any of those but it's just kind of have it adapted to yourself so that you know okay these are the things that I usually do enjoy what can I pull out of here that will help me and then finally the last skill is build positive experiences again you can see that they have there is nourishing activities and depleting activities Nourishing activities help lift the mood, increase energy, and help you feel calm and centered. The pleasing activities lower the mood, drain your energy, and they increase stress and tension. Again, exams are depleting. It takes all your energy to study and get everything done. Again, you have to do it because you're in college, but you also have to balance it with nourishing activities so you can keep up, so you can do all this, all that's required from you. So... Increasing the amount of nourishing activities is beneficial. Reducing or making changes to the bleeding activities could help just, you know, regulate that and just make things a little bit easier for yourself. Or you can learn to see those bleeding activities in a new way by changing the meaning you give to them. For example, again, with college, again, you have to get these things done because, you know, it's a course that you, did, oh, you wanted to do and you're really enjoying. So again, look at them like, okay, well, the motivations identify what your, most, your motivations are for doing them and just reminding yourself of them that look this is going to happen at the end when I'm done and this is all that you wanted to do and just reminding yourself of that while it's getting when you're finding it tough um and then just assess to see if this is the voice of depression speaking so whether it's you're feeling low and it's like negative voice um thoughts that you're having oh no I can't do this I can't do this again just pay attention to what voice is speaking at that time again and maybe change that to positive thoughts if you need but also make sure to do have your self-care and um, practices there just to help you fill up your cup a little bit so that's everything thank you so much and um, I think um Katie and I'm going to take some questions but you can ask any questions that you have um, and one of us will kind of answer it thank you thank you Thank you so much, Gertrude. That was brilliant. Um, um, thank you to all our panelists. We um, we covered a lot of information there in the hour. Um, so I'm aware um, we have uh, just a few minutes there. If anyone does have any questions, they want to type them in and I can um, bring them to the panelists. Um, but just to say that we will send on the recordings from today and we will send on everybody's slides as well. Um, so thank you everybody for Sorry, we're just there. Yeah, might be able to see me now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you for everybody joining us today. I'm just going to give it a minute and see does anybody have um, any questions? We've got a couple of um, thank yous and some great information there. So, yeah, we really did cover a lot today. So, I suppose we really just want to finish. Say best of luck with your exams. Um, and hoping you all took away some great tips today and it will benefit 
do in your exam time and not just you know now but you know all those tips especially like what Gertrude was saying and will benefit you throughout uh, your college life and work life as well so um thank you everybody for joining us today and if anyone wants to follow up with any information you can contact me at katie at asiam.ie and I will direct you to our panelists so thank you everybody um and thank you to our panelists Bye, everyone.